Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Ryan. I am an adjunct research professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at Carleton University. I'm also a research associate with the Kennedy Museum of Nature and a variety of other museums, including the Carnegie. I actually am a graduate of Carleton University. I graduated from the Biological Sciences Department in 1980, and I've been back working with the Earth Sciences Department for about 20 years now. A professor in the Earth Sciences Department who re recently retired, Dr. Claudia Schroer Adams and I, uh, put together a vertebrate paleontology program, which is currently running through the department. And uh, I've been uh, supervising students, undergraduates, graduates, and teaching courses there over the last 15, 20 years. Recently, we described a, a brand new uh, crocodile relative, um, Amphicotelus milesi. Um, uh, this paper was published in the uh, Royal Society Open Science Journal uh, by myself and a variety of Japanese colleagues. Um, I've been working with my Japanese colleagues now going back about 15 to 20 years. Uh, we overlap in our interests in vertebrate paleontology, in dinosaurs, and specifically when I was previously working in the United States at the Queen's Museum of Natural History, we were working on some of the primitive crocodiles that were in my collections there at that time. So we've collaborated a number of papers over the years, and they asked me to contribute to this new paper describing this uh, crocodile relative from the Jurassic Morrison formation of, um, of Wyoming. What is Amphicotylus milesi? So it's, as I said, it's a, it's a relative of crocodiles. It's actually um, goes back to the, uh, about 155 million years ago to the Jurassic. Um, true modern crocodiles, things like alligators, gavials, uh, crocodiles appeared in the fossil record about 95 million years ago. Um, they survived the terminal extinction event that wiped out all the dinosaurs that weren't birds. So, but the, the origins of this broader group goes back much deeper in time, almost 250 million years ago. Um, the animal that we've recently described would look very much like a modern day crocodile. But if you go back a little bit further in time into the Triassic, um, things that looked like crocodiles, the crocodilomorphs had a diversity of uh, morphological forms. There were things that looked like small dogs, large horses. There were crocodile things that don't look like crocodiles that could climb trees. But the one that we have looks very much like a modern crocodile. If you encountered it when you went back in your time machine to the Jurassic, you would say, oh, that's a crocodile. But one thing that's unique about it is that it has a certain um, little flap at the back of its jaws or the back of its throat that would have allowed it to um, close off the airway passage from the nose to the lungs so that it could um, hold prey items that it was trying to eat um, while, while the uh, head was underwater, but the nose was sticking out. This is something that modern crocodiles have. It allows them to uh, you know, ambush prey and pull them underwater without actually drowning while they're, they're trying to fight with this prey. Um, we infer this soft tissue based upon some bony correlates inside the uh, skeleton. There's a unique uh, series of bones in the, in the jaws called the hyoid bones. And there's some other unique shapes on the top of the inside of the skull that suggests that this existed. The, the fossil was actually found in 1993. Um, if you go back to the, um, the late Jurassic, it's what we call the golden age of dinosaurs. This is when you had the largest dinosaurs, some of the largest dinosaurs that ever lived roaming the land. Big giant sauropods with the long neck and the long tail. Um, the plated stegosaurs with those plates running down their back. A very uh, relatively lush environment, even though the environment was somewhat dry. Um, so these sauropods are found in uh, abundance in the Morrison Formation in Wyoming and the related states. In the process of digging up a large Camarasaurus, they actually found this articulated small um, crocodile-like crocodile specimen. It was actually um, uh, the team that, that put this the project together was actually based in Japan. They took the material back to Japan and it sat in collections for almost 30 years until my colleague, Dr. Yoshi Kobayashi, had one of his PhD students work on it. And because he and I had collaborated on crocodiles before, um, we I got involved with working with his student, uh, Junki, to describe the specimen. Now, with the code of the protocols, I wasn't, wasn't allowed to travel. But because we had beautiful photographs as well as CT scans um, that could allow us to essentially uh, do a digital three construction of the skull and the body in three dimensions, um, we could collaborate just over the internet. So it, it doesn't like rewrite the history of um, crocodiles and their, and their distant ancestors. But what it does do for us is it pins in time the, the origin of this very unique feature. 
Um, before, the, before the development of this feature that we first see in the specimen that we've described, um, we suspect that the animals that were hunting, that were crocodilians, um, had a much more difficult time trying to ambush prey and bring them into the water <clears throat> because um, the chances of trying to struggle with a prey underwater and then ingest water into your lungs was really high. With the development of this unique feature, we could now cut off um, the, uh, the mouth cavity going into the, into the stomach from the air passages going into the lungs. So it made it much easier for these animals to be able to uh, catch prey items and, and, and eat. When you have this kind of unique feature, it, it just opens up a whole new evolutionary realm. It allows these things to be more successful than the animals that, that don't have this feature. And we think that it might have been um, at least one of the things that contributed to crocodiles being one of the most successful long-lived group of uh, land vertebrates that ever evolved. If you look at the number of, of modern crocodiles and the relatives that are alive today, they're certainly not the most dominant group of land, of land vertebrates. But if you look at their evolutionary history from when they originated back in the Triassic, they have an unbroken uh, evolutionary history that goes for more than 250 million years. Um, they've been around roughly as long as dinosaurs have been around. And of course, dinosaurs are the most successful terrestrial vertebrates because modern birds are dinosaurs. And if you look at the number of species within birds, um, they outnumber the number of species within other reptile within reptiles or mammals. Fish, of course, there are many more fish in the oceans, but on land, birds are the dominant thing. But historically, um, both dinosaurs and crocodiles have very long lineage. So they, they needed to be able to adapt and survive throughout the millennia. And we think that this unique feature allowing them to breathe underwater by being able to stick their nose out of it, out of the water, uh, maybe one of those things that helped them um, be as successful as they are. And we still need to finish the, des the full description of the animal. So we've, uh, we've done a fairly good description of the post cranny of the animal, um, but we need to do, uh, we're gonna go into that a little more depth. Um, there are other some there are some related species that have also come out of Wyoming that we're um, hoping to be able to collaborate with other scientists on, uh, move our research team uh, and merge it with some other research teams. Um, we think that if we do this, we might actually be able to even trace this character further back in time. Crocodiles and dinosaurs are both members of the group called Archosauria. So, um, in addition to living birds, modern birds, which are living dinosaurs. The next most closer relative to dinosaurs are the crocodiles. So we can learn a lot about um, dinosaur evolution and systematics, who's related to who, by looking at modern and the ancient crocodiles. So we hope to be able to find more of these primitive crocodilian ancestors to understand more about the larger group that uh, they belong to with dinosaurs. So whenever I publish a new paper, I frequently get asked, what does this mean to the bigger picture of understanding the world? So without understanding the deep past, it's going to be very difficult to understand what is going on today and what's going on in what will be going on uh, both climatically and evolutionary within the history of the Earth. So the small new feature that we've described in this uh, primitive crocodilian ancestor isn't a ground shaking uh, new paradigm shifting for how we understand crocodilians. But crocodiles are one of the most endangered group uh, as a large group of animals that are on, on the, uh, the Earth today. They are very susceptible to climatic change because of where they live. They, uh, they, the, the groups that we have today primarily are water-based. So as the water quality both deteriorates and evaporates in some areas, um, they're very threatened. So by understanding a little bit more about their evolutionary history, we can understand a little bit more about how the modern groups live. And that just helps us to better preserve the living animals as well as their living environments. The majority of research that's published, it's all tiny little minuscule baby steps in the small little corner of the room that each one of our researchers are working on. But when you add it up in totality over what's published every year, every decade, we know a lot more about the world, the past, present and future than we did previously. And so this is just another little, one of those little building blocks and how that works. There are many contributors who uh, you know, were, were bound historically when the specimen was collected in 1993. Um, Western Paleontological Laboratories, which is still ongoing as a company in the United States, were the ones that did the logistics on the ground and actually drove the original excavation. So thanks to them. And then thanks to my colleague, Yoshi Kobayashi, and then his team for inviting me on board. It's been a real pleasure to work with them.